performance and preferences, general settings for the most common workflows. Let's jump into general settings and in particular, let's take a look at display color management and extended dynamic range monitoring. To turn display color management on, it does require GPU. And if you're not familiar with it, it's basically just using your monitor's display profile to display as accurately as it can anything that's playing on the timeline. Extended dynamic range is a newer type of display setting for higher end displays like Apple's Pro Display XDR. And you can turn this switch off or on. Both of these settings are available in Mac and Windows. For audio preferences, one of the most important settings to know is that you can turn off automatic waveform generation. This can be particularly useful when you're having long times to generate waveforms. You can also see you've got settings on where you want to place audition files when you send sequences to render, edit, and audition. And under audio hardware, usually it's best to leave them at the defaults but there are instances where you may want to monitor out of a different sound port or third-party I.O. One of the things to mention on third-party I.O. is these settings can change depending on the driver that gets released. We have seen this change over time. So you want to make sure to look at the driver notes, in particular any settings for Premiere Pro hardware monitoring. A few other areas of importance, things like auto saves and how often you save can be pretty critical, especially if you're backing up to a network volume or if you're even saving now to a cloud volume, how often do you want to save that project? Control surfaces, just being aware if they're connected. Sometimes control surface drivers can actually affect performance, especially if they're not up to date. So if you're having an odd situation that you can't figure out, one of the things you might want to do is, is set that control surface to none while you're doing some of your performance testing or troubleshoot testing. And also get a really good idea, as I had mentioned before, make sure you read the current driver notes on where the things need to be set. Device control is a pretty easy one here, but as I mentioned before, most important is going to be audio settings when you're troubleshooting anything to do with third-party I.O. Let's take a look at the playback preferences and in particular Mercury Transmit. If you're not familiar with Transmit, it's basically our term for full screen output on a dedicated external display. It could be on a third party device like Blackmagic, AJA, or Bluefish, or even a protocol, a virtual device like Nutex, VizRT's NDI. Using an available built-in HDMI port will always be the best option for performance because there's no real additional overhead other than what the GPU is already doing. However, there are times when you need professional video and audio monitoring, and a third-party I.O. is the only real option. Third-party I.O. generally also has a dedicated control panel or configuration app that can help you adjust for playback latency. You can either uh, plus frames or minus frames to make sure things are always in sync on the audio. One tip that I'll point out is to make sure that audio devices and video devices actually match to the same device to ensure things stay in sync. Let's take a look at media cache and performance. You can do quick cleaning of the media cache files just by clicking on the delete button under the remove media cache files. You can even automatically delete cache files every certain days if that's something you want it to automatically do. But more importantly, we've actually changed the way that you clean the media cache starting with Premiere Pro version 14 in 2020. There are four simple steps to follow. First thing you want to do is launch Premiere Pro and not open up any projects. Then you want to open Preferences Media Cache and then click the Delete button under the Remove Media Cache Files. And now you'll see a new pop-up that says Delete All Media Cache Files from System. Again, this will only happen when you follow these steps exactly. Why is this important to point out? As you've seen, performance has improved on a number of codecs over the past couple years. Formats like ProRes and H.265 are actually much faster in version 14 than they were in 13, and no doubt this will continue. What's actually happening on the back end is that the math is actually changing on how we decode these codecs. 
And that means that any rendered cache files or associated cache files will have older decode math. So a general rule of thumb is every time you upgrade Premiere, follow these four simple steps. Launch Premiere, open preference media cache files, click on delete media cache files, and then click on the delete all media cache files from systems option. A few notes on performance and shared storage and cache. CFA and peak files have been successfully used on shared storage using SSD cache. One example is open drives on several Hollywood film productions using Premiere Pro. Always keep the media cache database file local. That's really important. You don't want to put that on the shared storage. System clocks on client and server side can also cause issues with cache files as they can get out of sync due to differences in date timestamps. One of the most important things to know on this page is that media cache files equal accelerator files. And the two that you really want to worry about are CFA, the conformed audio file, and the peak file, which again is the data file for drawing the waveforms. There are some other accelerator files uh, different definitions as you see here. There's some for RED, some for MPEG-2 files and other things. We'll make sure you get a list of these just so you know what they are and when they get written. Performance and memory. The general RAM rule that we use is anything less than 32 gigs of RAM, we use a 70-30 rule. So 70% for Adobe apps and 30% for other apps. Anything more than 32 gigs of RAM, we set to an 80-20 rule. 80% 80 for Adobe apps and 20% for OS and other apps. In this particular example, the default is 6 gigs for other application, which includes OS. That's the default, and in this case, isn't correct. Because this system has 64 gigs of RAM, you want to change that to 12 gigabytes to follow that rule. There's another setting for optimized rendering for performance versus memory. You can set the optimized rendering to memory when you have a large number of high resolution video or still images in your sequence to help avoid low memory warnings. Generally, you just want to leave this set to its default, which is performance, but it is a good idea to know what this is used for. And sometimes you will see customers changing this to memory, thinking that it's a better setting. Other performance bottlenecks to be aware of Again, having an understanding of compressed formats. Always think about the decoding and the encoding for files like H.264, HEVC. How much resources is that taking? When it comes to uncompressed formats, the number one issue we see is storage throughput. Just not enough to handle uncompressed formats, especially of the larger frame size. Let's take a closer look at a format like Longop and why it causes extra work, especially for high cut rates. Longop compression only displays the changes between the iframes that you see here. So every time you make a cut, it has to calculate all four of these frames for each cut. It also has to check in those calculations every time you open the sequence. So the iframes are the intra frames. The P frames are the predictive frames, and the B frames are the bi-directional frames. But the most important thing to know is that every time you have an interframe, we have to calculate the P and B frames. Again, this can really affect performance. So if you're working on a large documentary, it might not be a bad idea to transcode that into a different format, like maybe a ProRes or a DNX codec, which have a lot less performance hit on the system and these projects will open much faster. Smart rendering, which is just another way of saying frame copying, will take unchanged frames or preview frames and copy those when we go to export so those don't have to be recalculated. So in basic terms, when exporting, smart rendering can be used for certain formats to create better quality output by avoiding recompression when possible. But smart rendering only works if the source codec size, frame rate, and bit rate match the export settings. So in this case, you see our sequence settings. We've got a QuickTime ProRes 422HQ set as our preview file format because that's going to match my export preset when I go to export this. And again, everything needs to be exactly the same. 
Also, when you export anything that's green on the timeline, you want to make sure that you have the use preview files checked that will copy those frames over when you go to export. Certain codecs and MXF wrappers, for example, can do smart rendering. AVC Intra can do it if it's an OP1A and AS11. Generally, all of these are OP1A, so DNX, as you can see here, JPEG 2000, so long as it's a 12 bit in a PQ space, uh, OP Atom, for example, OP1A and AVC Intra, as I mentioned, DNX, XDCAM HD, XDCAM EX, AVC Intra can also use OP1A. Codex and a QuickTime wrapper that supports smart rendering are animation, Avid DNX HD when it's in a QuickTime wrapper, GoPro Cineform, the non uncompressed RGB 8 bit, then the various ProRes formats from 422 all the way to 444 can all be used in smart rendering. Let's take a look at export settings and how it affects performance because a few small settings can make all the difference in export speed. Let's take a look at the format H.264. One of the first things you want to do, and really with any format, is to use the match source if possible. This should be set to default, and you can tell as all the settings will be grayed out. You can uncheck those if you need to make changes manually. Another common thing we see that adds to render times is people will have render at maximum depth. You do not want this unless you're dealing with high color formats like HDR. So generally you would leave this unchecked. The hardware encoding setting is automatic and will light up if all conditions are met. The use maximum render quality only needs to be set when you're scaling video or still images up or down. And again, in many cases we see this checked and it only adds to render time. You only need it if you're scaling up or down. So let's wrap this section up talking about performance. And one of the places you see this is online performance videos and benchmarks. I do a lot of these myself, as I'm sure some of you do as well. The number one rule is always question everything you're seeing. When it comes to codec, probably the first thing you wanna look at is are they CPU or GPU enhanced? Are they GPU effects? Because remember, if they are, not all GPU effects are equal. Premiere Pros and even After Effects Gaussian Blur does tend to use a lot of GPU where opacity effects do not. So when you're trying to get GPUs to spike, it totally is dependent on what GPU effect you're using and how much resources it takes to calculate. Is there a shared load on the final render between the GPU and CPU? Remember when we were bringing up the performance monitors, either Task Manager, Mac OS Activity Monitor, I'm kind of watching those things to see how much resources it's taking on either side. Sometimes you can see a nice even between both, or sometimes you'll see one or the other spike. What's the frame size? Obviously 4K and 8K make a huge difference. We're even seeing 12K now, and it also makes a huge difference when it comes to the amount of VRAM you need on your GPU. And then finally, it's always good to really know what the export frame rate is and to watch that carefully.